kid. Seriously. Welcome to a fantastic episode of the Kid Seriously Show. We're the only podcast around that will stretch, turn invisible, burst into flames, and be the rock of your lives all in about one hour. Every now and again, we get together to discuss the news, play our award-winning trivia question game show, and answer some of your questions, as well as discuss other things from Nerdland that might tickle our fancy. I am Maya Madrid, and to my left, it's the Doctor of Doom, it's Luke Neitzel, and to my right, way to my right, the mole man himself, shaded away from the light, it's Portland's own Mark Neitzel. Gentlemen, how are you? I'm outstanding. I got to spend my entire weekend inside youth basketball courts watching uh, third graders play competitive basketball while grown men scream at them and talk about how they can't be two sport athletes anymore. So... <laughs> It's a fun, fun way to spend a weekend. It was actually kind of fun because I like watching my son play and he, he really likes it. So it makes it worth it. But man, it makes for a long weekend. So you're going to let your son be a two sport athlete? Oh, he's a three sport athlete oh, and he can sure. be an eight sport athlete if he wants to. And that coach can lick my balls if he has a problem with it. For the record, it wasn't a coach in my program. It was another coach I heard talking about so it. So now you're but... going cross program ball licking. Like That's that. right. That's right. My balls can be licked by any program. Mark, you? I am fantastic as well because, wait, well, before we go any further, why did I get Mole Man? I don't know, because I wanted the two villains to set myself up as the hero. Galactus, Silver Surfer. They they weren't in the movie, though. They didn't pop out of the sewer with a monocle. And you also live in Portland, dude. So you're like in So you're a mole person. Shut the fuck up. All right, it's basically, there's no, oh, God. They, I'm sure they have moles in Portland. <laughs> so it's about being sh- sheltered yeah. away from the light. It's a deep cut from our most recent episodes where you would complain about not, you know, seeing sunlight or whatever you were whining about. Oh, well, good. Now I can complain about being interrupted. Right. So I'm fantastic because after two weeks, we finally have a bed and I'm no longer sleeping on an air mattress on the floor. So I actually got a good night's sleep last night. I didn't wake up in the divot created by a deflating mattress over the course of an evening. So I'm rested. I'm ready to go. Excellent. Well, I have a bit of uh, somber news. One of my good friends, Stephen Hansen, um, a guy that I had uh, created a couple of online role-playing games with over the years. I've known him for almost half a decade now, and he's a fantastic uh, computer coder. Um, he passed away this weekend. Um, it wasn't unexpected, um, but it, it's kind of tragic and so coming here i know a lot of the people who listen to this come from that game and knew us from that game and so there are a lot of people out there who in our circles who are are pretty down this week so steve wherever you are i hope there's a thousand hot dudes with with abs of steel and as much liquor as you can drink um, for all of eternity so sorry man yeah it's horrible it it sucks um he's he's a pretty young dude and uh would would i have met him would did he work at the the board game? No, this is... I, I met him within the last five years. Oh, okay. So. That sucks. Yeah, it's it's pretty weak, but... Um, My well. condolences to you and his family. Thanks, man. <laughs> um, in any events, let's get right to Hobie Baker's favorite game show. Am I right? Am I wrong? Or am I just dreaming? You're wrong. It's Am I Right or Am I Wrong? In true American style, these two boys are going to offer up their earnest opinions, which we will either take as fact or immediately mock. Here's how the one or the two-player version of our game works. Seven questions I'm going to administer tonight as our champion, Luke Neitzel, takes on the challenger, Mark Neitzel. I'm going to ask each of these brothers a question, flip-flopping the order serpentine style. If one of the guys guesses the right answer, they get the point. If neither do, I'm going to pick the idea that I like the best. Gentlemen, are you ready? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Bring it on. All right. Question number one. President Trump skipped out commemorating troops in Europe this week because of the weather. In 2017, the Canadian Prime Minister, Justin Trudeau, in the middle of the rain, said, As we sit here in the rain, thinking how uncomfortable we must be as these minutes... As our suits get wet and our hair gets wet and our shoes get wet, I think it's all the more fitting that we remember on the d- on that day in Dieppe, the rain wasn't rain, it was bullets. Gentlemen, what's the dumbest reason you've ever given for getting out of something you didn't want to go to? What? Who's first? 
Uh, the ch- the champion goes first. Okay, so the the <laughs> the dumbest reason I use to try and get out of something. Yeah. Oh, man, usually my reasons for everything are so justified that this is going to be a, a tricky one for me, and I'm I'm completely not trying to stretch anything Cycle the at all. Uh, I, I, guess, uh, I, I guess the reason I, I, in freshman year of college, I started working at the zoo to try and make ends meet, but it wasn't a, it wasn't a particularly fun job. It wasn't a particularly close job, which made it tricky when I didn't have a car. So I, it, it's a legitimate excuse, but it, it, it's kind of a wacky one. I took a job at a gay bar instead. So couldn't, couldn't go to the zoo anymore because I was hanging out with hot dudes listening to show tunes and... I really wish Steven was listening to this. He yeah. would love that particular part. Yeah. And he'd ask me to send pictures of you. Yeah, and I, I can now actually, in my head, if you ever hear the song uh, Waiting for Tonight by Jennifer Lopez, in my head, I've seen that video so many times there that I can actually tell you what's happening at the video moment by moment as it goes on. I like it. Mark, what you got? Are you there? Oh, I'm here. Okay. I'm just demonstrating to you what the the lamest excuse I've ever given for not going to something was. It was not that I gave an excuse. I just stopped talking to whoever altogether. It's worked for bad dates. It's worked for uh, employers. And... The real question is, is is it going to work right now? Because I think we're going to find out momentarily. All right, we're going to go... Uh, well, I like the, the creativity of Mark. I'm going to go point Luke on this one just because uh, Boom is a place that I that I didn't really work at specifically. I basically subcontracted. Um, so, um, J- Just for clarification's Homer. sake, it you said Boom. It's Boom! Okay. There is an exclamation point. And, and not to be confused with my daughter, who also goes by the nickname Boom. Oh, wow, yeah. <laughs> Either way. <laughs> All right, question two. This one starts for Mark. Mark, uh, Star Wars is the gift that keeps giving for Maya. First, they gave me a movie that only I wanted in Solo, a Star Wars story. And, and only it, you liked. Uh, it's true. <laughs> and uh, and uh, now they capped it off with news that a Cassian Andor show is coming to Disney+. Plus. The story will focus on earlier adventures of everyone's favorite rebel spy, and I hope delve into his separatist upbringing. Boys, news could not be better for me, but tell me, which Star Wars story would I want even more? Wait, which story would you want? What I want. We're going to test how well you know me. Hmm. Okay. Well, let's see. You like formula and repetition. So you, you also have a thing for vaguely swarthy men with dark looks and slightly mysterious backgrounds. So um, pulling from my vast Star Wars knowledge, the dude who was the rebel in The Last Jedi, the one who staged the, the, the mutiny and was played by Oscar Isaac. Poe Dameron. On something about that character going on a hero's quest, where eventually he finds out that some villain is his father and then seeks to redeem him in the third arc. <laughs> I like I like how it got wrapped up there at the end. <laughs> Luke, what you got? Uh, I feel like this this may be a cheat or maybe maybe it's a a surprise because I, I feel like we had a, a similar question before, maybe predating Mark's appearances on this show. So I'm gonna I'm gonna go with that answer because it's what you brought out. But it's the the backstory of how uh, Paige Tico's sister Rose became one of the. Uh, the key members of the resistance. So it would be the, uh, the Rose Tico prequel is what you'd be looking for. Those are both really, really good answers and deep cuts from people who have studied the old tapes of this show. But unfortunately the answer is you're both wrong. It's Jin Erso. She's my favorite character and um, I love her in casting. So if I get a casting story, I want a Jin Erso story. I'm going to give the point to Mark on this because one of my favorite characters is uh, Poe Dameron. So maybe it's just because I like his looks. I don't know, but uh, point wait, Mark. Wait, wait, wait. Who, who is Jin Erso again? She's the... the uh, Felicity she... Jones in Rogue One. 
You mean the one they made a movie about? Yeah. I want m- more. So you about. want a movie about the person they made a movie about? I like yeah. that. I like that he got the point and he's arguing about the I answer. Don't know. Yeah, I've, I do. I, in a serious question, have you seen any of Forces of Destiny? No. Which are like ten minute shorts that they have. I mean, they're they're kid geared, right, right. but they're they, they have gin in them. Right they through, do. Uh, yeah. Them, so. Yeah, and they're yeah, and they're you know they're ten minutes and they're kid facing, but they they aren't exclusively female characters, but they're heavy into the the oh, female those characters. Those are the only ones that Boom watches. So. Oh, perfect. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, I've seen a couple of those watching them with my daughter, and they're pretty good. Yeah, I'll check them out. Hey guys, question three. This one starts with Luke. President Trump has announced that Elvis Presley, Antonin Scalia, and Babe Ruth will all receive the Presidential Medal of Freedom for outstanding con- contributions to the United States, apparently circa 1953. If you were president, after a day of destroying ICE and the hopes and dreams of all fascists, who would you award the Presidential Medal of Freedom to? We go to Luke. Ooh. So that would be good. I would give that to Stormy Daniels. (laughs) Touche. And we switch over now to Mark. Well, first off, I feel like Luke needs to give us the reasoning behind that, exactly what it is in her body of work that he so appreciates that he feels a presidential medal of freedom is is warranted. You know, I, I you know, I, I liked her before she got big, you know, and went went all commercial. Like, you know, people hadn't even heard of her, and I was like really into her early stuff. And then she she got all mainstream, and I, it kind of died out for me a little. But now that some time has passed, I'm kind of like ready to appreciate the whole you know kind of whole thing of her career. So. Um, you know, just, just want everyone to know, like, I was into it so first, because I'm like, yeah. you know, I could almost live in Portland, I'm so into it. Yeah. You, you felt she sold out with 40-year-old virgin? Was she in that? Yes. Was she? Really? <laughs> what was she in that? What do you think? A porn star? Yes. <laughs> okay. I haven't seen that movie in so long, I don't remember a ton about it. She was, she was part of Paul Rudd's Boner Jams 93 mixtape. Oh, perfect. Perfect. Yes. Well... Yeah, great. Well, now I can think about Paul Rudd at the same time. So so my answer, um, because when Mario was going over who was being awarded the, the Medals of Freedom this year, he forgot to mention uh, Minnesota Supreme Court Justice and Vikings great Alan Page. Now, I would think that the other three members of the front line of the Purple People Eaters also deserve Presidential Medal of Freedom because you can't really just separate them out they were all so terrific and they all deserve recognition for being the dominating force that they were so you're going to complete the set give them matching ones all three remaining linemen well that's an answer that i really don't give a shit about so uh point to luke and um you Woo-hoo. know i think it would be better to give uh to give awards to people who won uh number four so this one goes back to mark there's a rumor out there that carl weathers this is no lie. <laughs> Carl Weathers. Got yourself a stew, baby. <laughs> is going to get a part in The Mandalorian. Star Wars other live action show planned for Disney Plus. What off the wall casting decision would you make if you needed to bring in another glorious name into this series by John Favreau? Before we get into that, imagine a Mandalorian and Carl Weathers, the 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 handshake arm wrestling in midair while flexing veins that they could do like Boba Fett's armor would burst off from the force of that. So anyway, Mark, I'll leave it back to you. Oh, the correct well, answer for question three was childish Gambino, by the way. Oh, nice. Luke, I'd like to thank you for shitting all over my answer because I was going to say Arnold Schwarzenegger so they could make the manliest handshake in a galaxy far, far away. Well, it's already been done. So I don't think that's a, a, a fair answer. Luke, um, everything in star Wars has already been done. <laughs> no, actually, just the same thing is done over and over and over. It's really, it's really not that many things when you you get to it. Um, so I'm not gonna get the point for this. I already know it. But this is what I actually think is going to happen on the Mandalorian, and it's gonna piss my off to no end. So I'm gonna go with it, and it is wacky casting. I think we're gonna get to the end of the first season of the Mandalorian, and they're going to reveal that the Mandalorian is Bubba Fett. So it's casting Bubba Fett in a movie where you're specifically saying it's not actually him, just a copy of him, then having it actually be him. And by that, I mean Timo whatever from New Zealand that, that played Django. 
Well, unfortunately, you guys are both wrong. Um, I'll give you I'll give out the point for the best answer in just a second, but the one that I really want to see is a digitally recreated Angela Lansbury. So um, I think with this one... But a- go... aged, so she looks older. Right, right. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I'm going to go with... Uh... <laughs> she's nothing but a neck waddle at that point. <laughs> so basically, she's Jabba the Hutt. Like, yeah. that's just, yeah. Well, it's a cameo. Um... Oh, what if, what if you made a digitally created Angela Lansbury, and the neck waddle was Jabba the Hutt that you added in? So it was like she had Jabba the Hutt living in her neck. This is getting disgusting. Um, <laughs> so I'm going to give the point to, uh, uh, to Mark on this one. So it's two to two. Uh, basically, I have no desire to see Boba Fett return as King of the Boba Fetts. So. I I don't even mind because now I'm just desperately wishing I could animate Angela Lansbury <laughs> with Jabba the Hutt living in her neck. We go back to uh, to Luke for this question. Jimmy Butler, formerly of the NBA's Minnesota Timberwolves, has been traded to the 76ers for Sarge and Covington and a second round pick after successfully making his employer's life hell. Uh, it seems like likely that Butler was salty over the Wolves' decision to give big contracts to Carl Anthony Towns and Andrew Wiggins. Who is the one person in your life who acted like a complete a-hole and totally got what they wanted anyways? We start with Luke. The one per- I feel like this has a very specific no, no, it's thing not, it's I'm not, supposed to be recalling. No, I mean, like, name one person. It should be the one person. Oh, okay. Name one person in my life who has acted like uh, an a-hole and still gotten exactly what they want uh that that would be uh someone that we all know this is gonna make for great podcasting (laughs) since i have to uh uh that may have shared shared one common thing with me that was very detrimental being maybe possibly our first names um and who was just a slimy you know slimy monster of a man and got way more things than he he deserved out of it all right, Mark. Stormy Daniels. <laughs> Point Luke. He nailed it. Oh, is that, <laughs> yeah, is that the correct that answer? The correct answer. Nice. Yeah. All right, number six. So that gives you three to two. You got to win one of two to retain the championship. Mark needs to run the table. Now, Fantastic Beasts is coming out soon, and a nation of Harry Potter lovers line up to pay respects to a quickly unraveling franchise. This is terrible news. My, my wife's going to be heartbroken. Reviews are coming out, and they're not good. Let's take a look at some. From the Daily Te- Telegraph, Robbie Collin. But everything about the crimes of Grindelwald is inward-looking and self-referential. It smacks of an epic join-the-dots game played across reams of unpublished appendices and footnotes. The result is one of the gravest cases of prequelitis in Star Wars The Phantom Menace, in which, in place of ordinary storytelling, a chessboard's worth of characters and objects are fussily rearranged over the course of two hours plus change in order to set the stage for whatever comes next. And this... From the New York Times, Manola Dargis. On the page, Rowling is a master storyteller, creating worlds so richly populated and densely textured that you can easily summon them up in your mind without ever, ever having watching a single ab- adaptation of her work. What occasionally trips her up, though, is plot structure. The arrangement of all her attractive whirling parts. Steve Close, who wrote all but one of Harry Potter's movies, was gifted at giving cinematic shape to Rowling's increasingly long novels with all their detours detours and savorly details. Here, however, Rowling has surrendered to her maximalist tendencies and so cluttered up the story that you spend far too much time trying to untangle who did what to whom and why. Guys, for my wife, these reviews are going to be unyielding, uh, an unyielding, unmitigated, and heartbreaking disaster. What was the last movie you went to with high hopes only to come out completely devastated? We start with Mark. The last movie with completely high hopes that I came out completely devastated that will still win me the answer point. It's not going to be The Force Awakens because I was not in any way, shape, or form disappointed by that movie. Um, <laughs> I'm actually, actually, no. no. What I'm going to go with that I can really think of would be The Matrix Reloaded. Um Solid answer. That's coming strong. What? That's strong answer. Real strong. It was was such uh, a mess in setting up the third movie while being overly long, um, intentionally dense, and who knew 
that a 26 minute car chase slash action scene would actually wind up just being kind of boring and be make you just want it over. So Matrix Reloaded. Can you please read the phrasing of the question part? Sure. Um, what was the last movie? Last movie. To... Okay. Just wanted to make, clarify that I heard that correctly, since that movie's 20 years old now. So for my movie as well. Apparently so. Uh, and I wasn't expecting anything from Avatar going in, so it's hard touché. to be disappointed. Touche. Touche. First off, I'm going to take a little side detour, because we're, we're in a new studio, the South Lawn Studio, which is really extravagant, so extravagant that while we are recording this, I am also watching the Oilers play the Avalanche, and I have found the, the biggest douchebag in the crowd, who is in the Avalanche section in the right, in Edmonton, wearing an Aaron Rodgers jersey and Red Sox hat. So keep an eye out for that guy <laughs> at the Oilers <laughs> game. <laughs> It, the only way it could be worse is if he has a cub starter jacket. <laughs> no, it's it's when he pulls up his sleeve and shows his Laker tattoo. Anyway, uh, for for me, it's Batman versus Superman, uh, which the Matrix Reloaded is a good answer. That is a terrible movie. Batman versus Superman, uh, I've seen more recently. I saw in the theater. It looked cool from the previews. I really liked Man of Steel more than a lot of people seem to retroactively, even though I think people liked it at the time. Um it had a cool look to it. I liked that Superman. It was exciting to get a new Batman. We'd never seen those characters done before. I liked Zack Snyder going into this because the only things I had seen of his were Man of Steel, which I liked, and Dawn of the Dead, which I, I liked as well. So I thought he could really do this. And the the big worry going into the whole thing was Ben Affleck, which actually turned out to be the basically the only good thing. And instead, what we got is just a jumbled, disaster mess of a movie. One of the worst villain performances from Jesse Eisenberg that I've ever seen in my life. He's in the corner back here. You need him to pan over down there. Oh, but anyway, that Jesse that movie, the, the fan, the, the fan. <laughs> I saw my head cutting in to be like, where is this guy? Because they were in that part of the ice. But anyway, uh, Batman versus Superman is the answer for me. Like, there, there is nothing salvageable about that. And it, it's, I, I don't even hate Justice League, even though I get why everyone else hates Justice League. But it, they, sh and I love Wonder Woman, but man, if they would have just shut everything down at that stage, I, I would have been okay with it because that was such an utter failure. Well, you're both wrong. The answer is Last Jedi. Um, but I'm going to give the point to Mark here because the, the Matrix Reloaded is such a, I took that one harder than Batman versus Superman. I was really excited for both movies. Both movies were unmitigated disasters. Both movies were supremely disappointed. But which one did I take worse? It was Matrix Reloaded. So, tie game going into the seventh. Here we go. A recent flight from Kansas City. This is for the championship. A recent flight from Kansas City to Chicago turned hilarious after an American Airlines baggage handler got drunk and fell asleep in the cargo hold, making the trip as he slumbered away. Gentlemen, the only casualty was the man's pride, as he did not need any medical attention because the cargo hold was both pressurized and heated. But this got me thinking, where was the craziest place you ever woke up after a night of drinking? Well, first off, he probably did also lose his job, too, so I'm guessing his pride wasn't the only thing to go. <laughs> I don't think he actually did. I read the article, remember, but it, it goes to uh, it goes to loot. Well, uh, I haven't actually... It's I'm actually proud that I came up with this as quickly as I did because I hadn't thought about this in years or whatever. So I'm amazed I, I remembered it. But I one time in college woke up in the broom ball court uh, across the street from the, the, the whatever the student gym facility was close to that the house where we lived. I, I think I only fell asleep there for like 20 minutes or something like that. But it was one of those things where I was pretty close to blackout drunk. I remember walking down a sidewalk and all of a sudden I'm like waking up in this, this broom ball court. So that was a, a proud, proud moment. And it doesn't mean I have to name a specific person either. Cause there's some of those as well. <laughs> okay. Well, so mine, I actually had a two for in the same night and it's, it's not as much that they were in and of themselves. <laughs> wow. <laughs> um, but They were so, nice, clean girls. Mm-hmm. Nothing. Go ahead with your twofer. Okay. So 
the, it, it started out, this was my, my first um, official party as a pledge at the fraternity to which we have all pledged our undying allegiance. And Forever. Recently banned from Madison, by the way, for really? throwing, throwing a TV at a woman. You know what? Oh, oh good. good for those that. guys were dicks at Madison. <laughs> <laughs> Too bad they can't just ban Madison, period. But <laughs> anyway... So things are going fine, and then I'm, I'm having a few beers, and of course, being a new pledge, everybody's letting me pull from the bottles of the secret stash in their rooms, and um, eventually, at some point in the night, things get a little fuzzy, and I sort of black out, and about one in the morning, I woke up on the floor of my dorm room, just in my underwear, covered in drool. Wow. Now, I have no idea... When I left, how I got there, how anything happened, just that suddenly I woke up there. And it was only about one in the morning, right? So I did what any self-respecting freshman in college did. I got up, I cleaned myself off, put my coat on, I went back over the four blocks, because I was only in Sanford Hall at the time. So I went about four blocks, went back to the party, continued to drink. Then I'd say probably about 4 a.m. I blacked out again only to wake up around 8 or 9 o'clock, sleeping on a pile of clothes in one of the closets in the upstairs room. Again, no idea how I got there. So it wasn't that either was particularly crazy. It was sort of this whole sequence of events and nights that led up to me blacking out, not once, but twice, and winding up in places I didn't anticipate. The only thing I'll say is I'm going to envision, I'm going to envision Dale heavily involved in both these scenarios. <laughs> Um, he may have played a part at some point during the evening, though thankfully it was not his room that uh, I wound up in. It's a good thing no one listens to this podcast, because this episode's going to be indecipherable. Right. <laughs> <laughs> the, uh, the point here, and still champion whoop, whoop. of Am I Right or Am I Wrong, is going to go to Luke, uh, basically on proximity, because my answer is a snowbank that was actually just a couple of blocks. Oh, really? You, yeah, so after a, a fight with a gal named Jenny, um, and after a delt party, I woke up in a snowbank, and happy that I did, or I'd probably be dead right now. So, um, Luke, your song. Boots and or cacao. Go, let's go, let's go crazy. Let's get nuts. I guess you can dare a lick my balls, Capitan. All right. Uh, hey, Mark. Hey, yeah. Hey, Luke. Hey, what? I saw a movie, and it was <laughs> on your recommendation. <laughs> it's Roger Corman's 1994 Fantastic Four movie. Do you want to start us off over here, Luke? Sure. All so right. I was very excited to see that this had been uh, released again on YouTube, and it appears to have staying power because it hasn't been taken down yet, and it's been up for almost a week. So that's pretty exciting. So I finally got to see this thing. And I'll I'll start I'll start running through it. So feel free to chime in whenever you want here, guys. But this this movie starts out, and right off the bat, the music is what jumps out at yeah. me. Because man, this is a musical triumph. This is a soap opera times twelve with the swells and the things they are able to bring in. You know why why say something with one note when you can say it with forty at extra loud volume? But anyways, we start out where we meet a. 45-year-old Reed Richards pretending he's a freshman in college with a friend named Victor, who I, I'm not entirely sure what that could mean, but, you know, his name's just Victor or whatever. Yeah, it's cool. Don't worry about it. And, very excited to start, we get our first and probably only, really, celebrity cameo, but it's Commandant Lassard from Police Academy, who is their professor. Who's the overexcited <laughs> professor. Very excited. Who's teaching them about a comet that's going to pass by. And uh, Reed and Victor have a super secret experiment they're going to run on this comet. And uh, they're going to try and, I don't know, steal its energy or who knows. Whatever. It doesn't, they really don't get into it. And we don't have to either. It doesn't matter. But they go back to the house where uh, Reed is living, which is the Storm boarding house. And immediately the terror in my eyes rose <laughs> as we meet a 12-year-old Sue Storm. And like this an is, eight-year-old. This is very comic-like. Like this is straight out of the comments. Like 
It's a little too close to the comics. My, my God, and in my head, I, the way I thought they were going, and luckily they don't go this way, is I thought they were going to, like, sneak onto the spaceship, and, like, the radiation was going to age them, and then he was going to fall in love with a 12-year-old and a 22-year-old woman's body, but luckily that didn't happen. <laughs> but anyways, I, I'm incredibly freaked out. Uh, we also meet Ben Grimm, who is the same age as Reed and lives in the boarding house and is his, his, uh, his buddy. And they, uh, he, he's not really too involved. He's just kind of there. And Victor and Reed go off to do their experiments as the comic comes by. But there is a horrible error. And all the electricity seems to bounce off their apparatus and go <laughs> st- straight into Victor. Can, can we just pause here for a second? Now, yeah. I've worked in higher education for quite some time. And there is no way... That any school is letting two random freshmen conduct experiments on multi-million dollar equipment all by themselves, unsupervised at night. <laughs> what? <laughs> and, yeah, and it, it, these these two geniuses are so smart and so accomplished that they're taking some basic level one thousand science class where Ben Grimm is also in <laughs> attendance. I mean. But we know Reed's smart because he had to answer a question for the professor. Right. They're not they're not postdocs. They're not you know, they're not even working on their doctorates. They're just freaking you know, juniors. Yeah, but their experiment also didn't go right either. So maybe that was part of the you know That is the weird thing about the Fantastic Four. You're supposed to immediately buy that Reed Richards is the smartest man on the planet for Fantastic Four to work. But the whole story is dependent on him totally fucking things up. Yeah, so. and he he does it well. Yeah. <laughs> who who knew that taking a shuttle without uh, coordinating with ground control could possibly go wrong? <laughs> Not me. But I, <laughs> anyways, they uh, uh, Victor is pronounced dead. We think <laughs> by you know a doctor and two men with uh, vague Eastern European accents who happen to be just hanging around. And then my heart grew a lot larger as we moved 10 years forward. Yes. So. Now, you thought that the, the time jump was new in Fantastic Four and the 2015 ones, but this is like the OG time jump, which I think we're all thankful for, uh, given both Susan's age and Johnny's, because, man, he was annoying. Yes, he was. He was eight years old He doesn't something. actually get much less annoying, unfortunately, but never mind. Keep going. No, he's in basically a psychopath yeah. <laughs> throughout the course of this movie. But anyways, we go to the uh, the present day, 10 years later, where Reed's hair has grown 50 years in age. Uh, me- meanwhile, they're going to, him and Ben are, uh, Ben's an ace Air Force pilot, and he's going to fly Reed's shuttle because they're going to go up and actually get the comet this time because it's passing again, even though 10 years ago they said this was the closest it had ever passed in like a million years, but apparently it was a quick loop and then... Then back. But the only way they can do it is having a very plasticky looking ginormous football diamond to power the whole thing. So they have this diamond, and there's the mysterious face that's watching them, Dr. Evil style, through hidden cameras, who wants the diamond as well. Is it Victor? We don't know at okay, this point. Right. We're not Whatever. sure. But. I've read the comics. But, right when you think the story might be a tad simplistic. Bam! Curveball! Sewer man emerges! <laughs> a guy pops his head out of the sewer and says he needs that diamond as an offering as well. And he is the most low-rent Batman Returns penguin we have ever seen. Like, it was like they were like, do that design, but we can afford one prosthetic and one monocle. <laughs> and that is the jeweler who has a, like, tribe of Molochs down there, or Morlocks or whatever, that uh, he rules. They're the mole men. Um, and but this brings us to our fa- my favorite part in the movie, where uh, they're walking into a building and Ben Grimm encounters Alicia. Alicia Masters, who he has never met before. She has never met him. It doesn't sound like they've actually heard of each other. And um, he immediately bumps into her and breaks all her artwork she's been working on. She's blind. Um, and uh, as is the case, he forcibly grabs her against her will and lifts her up, which she tells him not to, and this, they both immediately fall in love. This 
this movie is kind of rapey. Like there are several <laughs> just, movies. Just a, there's there's the just whole thing. Tad. With, yeah, with Sue being like a child, and then later we're gonna get to some stuff too. But like, yeah, it's it's a little rapey. Can we just? I forgot to mention too. At one point, ten, 10 or eleven year old Sue does say the actual line. Oh, that Reed Richards, he's so dreamy. Yes, she does. That was, that was written on paper and delivered by a 12-year-old girl about a 45-year-old man. Um, he just keeps getting older and older. It or... felt like he got older and older. Um, but he's also a freshman in college. Yes. <laughs> How smart is this yes. dude, really? Yes. So the jeweler is able to go in and steal the diamond and replace it with an equally plastic-looking football-shaped diamond and take it into the sewer for reasons we do not yet know. But uh, Dr. Doom finds that hilarious because he's like, well, Reed will just blow up in space. So that's that's pretty awesome. So the, It is kind of funny, actually. <laughs> it is kind of funny, actually. Uh, so Ben and... Uh, ben and uh, Reed are going to fly up there, but they have to bring two completely uh, unrelated people with them to the mission at hand, which is Sue and Johnny, who they, they go to say goodbye to, but they realize they have to bring them with. And it's an interesting scene for me as how it's put together, because the only reason they bring Sue and Johnny in the ship is because they've been intimately working with them on this project, like Ben actually says that. But apparently Reed and Sue have been working so close together but haven't seen each other in 10 years because they are immediately smitten when they see each other on a stairwell. I feel like you're really missing the part where like Ben comes back to Mrs. Storm's place and there's that cheesy music and it is the most cringeworthy acting I've ever seen in my entire life. Like the music like swells and it's just very saccharine oh, and it, it was... It's very clear that the the major casting mistake they made was not making Emma Sams uh, play the Alicia Masters category because this is this is as soap opery as it as it gets. Like this is this is this is all my children times eleven. Yeah. What what she they're doing she here? Should have been running the boarding house. She, she should have been Doctor Doom. <laughs> <laughs> Anyway, they go into space. The diamond does not work. Their spaceship explodes, and they they crash onto Earth. Uh, we, we think America, but we don't really know. And uh, Reed does put together that hey, we're not all dead. We're not. We're not even hurt. Uh, and nothing is wrong with any of them. And that's where all their powers manifest. So Sue's invisible. Johnny can shoot a very Atari-looking flame blast out of his arm. Uh, uh, I. I I'm I'm just go ahead and say it that Reed's stretching ability is far superior to the uh, 2000s Fantastic Four stretching ability. Um, and I then like the sound that it makes, it's like, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's like elastic snapping or something. <laughs> and then uh, and then we see Ben finally as the last one to emerge, who apparently has walked a long distance without looking at his hands or anything like that, because he doesn't realize he's turned into a rock monster until everyone tells him that he is a, a rock monster. Uh, well, everybody knows you don't actually feel your own skin at any point in time. No, no. And when you're walking forward, you always look exactly straight ahead and make sure never to see your hands or the rest of your body that is completely right. naked. I mean, you know, I get a single hair ingrown on my neck and I'm in pain for a week until I manage to pull the thing out with a pair of tweezers, but somehow he can sprout rocks out of every part of his body and just completely not notice. Yeah, it's crazy like that. So the military ends up coming and picking them up and telling them that they need to find them, and they take them all back. And a doctor examines them in a series of wacky vignettes where their powers go off on, on the poor doctor who's trying to figure out how to take blood samples and do all these other things with them. But then we learn it's a swerve. It's not an American doctor at all. It is Dr. Doom's doctor. And they are actually in... Do they ever actually say Latveria? I didn't notice that they did. I don't think they did, but it's Latveria that they're in. And Dr. Doom wants to find out how he can basically kill them, but take all their powers and put them in himself. So he can be super rocky, mm -hmm. invisible, fire-shooting, flexy man. They, uh, they decide that they are going to escape out of there, which you know they do in some extended fight scenes where... It, <laughs> my, favorite, my favorite part about them escaping is, is they actually... They actually knock some guys out, dress up in their suits, leave the thing behind, sneak through the building, only to go back to that room and have the thing just bust the doors down <laughs> so they can walk through the holes that he makes in these. Uh, we also have some action going on in New York as we find out the jeweler's insidious plan is to kidnap Alicia and give her the diamond so he can force marry her. Third rapey thing that happens. It's very Neymar Sue Storm, yeah. actually. <laughs> 
going on there. Uh, so they they go to kidnap kidnap her. Uh, meanwhile, Doom also wants his henchman to get the diamond back because he wants to power a machine to get the power of the comets as well. Because we're still on the comet. We're still on the comet. The comet still matters. The Fantastic Four escape and they go back to New York where they Sue immediately makes them uniforms um, <laughs> to wear. And because uh, women sew. That's what women do, Luke. They sew. That's true. And honestly, I think that is about her only contribution to any fight or battle that they have in this entire movie. Because she does not do anything other than make them uniforms. Ben, Ben is pissed off at Reed. He, he's like, yeah, you guys all got superpowers and I'm a giant rock monster. You know, people are scared of him on the street, that type of thing. So he kind of storms off and gets taken in by the, the mole people (laughs) who, who who want them. And they're all excited because he's super strong. Um, and also doom is closing in on the mole people because he's going to get the diamond. And what Ben then realizes is that they've actually, they've actually kidnapped Alicia at which point he is going to just beat the shit out of all of them because he's an indestructible rock monster, which bullets bounce off of, and that's all they have. But Alicia kind of fucks it all up because she realizes Ben is there and tells him she loves him and he is healed by the power of love. (laughs) His rock powers go away, which was weird. And then he walks out into the street, screams, and they come back. And then he decides to not just go beat the hell out of them all. He goes and gets the rest of them, and they they reunite as the Fantastic Four. They save Alicia, and we get the final confrontation from Doom, who traps them immediately in in General Grievous's ray shields, and starts to absorb their power using the comet or something. Also, somehow they're back in Latveria. I don't remember how that happened, but they are. <laughs> somehow they went from the sewer to Latveria, and uh. He's also going to shoot a giant laser to destroy New York. And uh, Reed is able... Um, unfortunately, the ray shields don't touch the bottom of the floor. They stop just below your... A- just at your ankle. So Reed is able to stretchy himself <laughs> out. Stalls. <laughs> exactly. And and turn it off. Man, he would... Oh, he would do well in the Minneapolis airport with Congressman, wouldn't he? <laughs> that never even occurred to me. Good old Reed. Anyways, he's able to turn it off. He has a fight with Doom. Doom kills himself for some reason, but then his... his glove still works and walks away um the laser is fired towards new york so uh the human torch turns into the full human torch which i will say it was a better effect than they used in lawnmower man slightly and then his plan is he just he kind of like fist punches the laser and gets shot by it a bunch until it goes to space instead of new york and uh then then reed and sue get married and we have now all seen the infamous unreleased Roger Corman's produced Fantastic Four. Maya, what you think of this movie? Um, well, I think it's interesting that this movie was only to keep the rights. Uh, they they never, you know, the powers that be never intended for the, anything to happen with this movie, but the cast didn't know that. And so that's one of the interesting things is watching it where the cast thinks that this is going to be released and real, and so they're trying, but terrible. And the writing is terrible, and the special effects, which, I mean, it looks like a PBS show. They um, did, And they did a full press tour yeah. for it as well. Oh, I didn't know that. Yeah, and they had oh. trailers and movie theaters for it. Really? Yeah. I didn't know that. Yeah, and then just just shelved it. I uh, Well, I'm glad that they did. Um, this was fun, but this is completely terrible. Um, only outdone by the Captain America movie that was done for the same reason. So, yeah, Starring that's what Ned I thought. Beatty. What's that? Starring Ned Beatty. Star- and and J.D. Salinger's kid with the rubber ears. That's Captain America, yeah, yeah, and he had the rubber rubber I ears over. Part of that one. That's, yeah, they started to rock it. Mark, what did you think of this one? Um, well, I, I think it has really helped me have a new appreciation for some of the jokes and nuances in Arrest in Arrested Development season four. Um, because that actually also with Tobias presented him doing a an extended Fantastic Four riff, which was actually more professional and <laughs> better done than this. Um, I it, it was horrible. It was a painful experience. Um, I, I desperately needed Joel and Crow and Tom Servo there to, to help me make sense of it all. It was, I, I didn't even make it to the, the finale, actually. I, <laughs> I, I don't even 
I, I couldn't do it at some point. It was just, it was so bad and it was late and I'd had a few beers and I just, I, I couldn't do it. So I wound up, I, it was somewhere of them breaking out of Latveria, I just stopped and watched old Rick and Morty episodes. I, I will say that um, I was kind of disappointed that it wasn't a little worse. Everything in my life now is done through the lens of the Star Wars Christmas special. <laughs> so I think that this is a little bit, or this is quite a bit better than that. And so um, I was a little disappointed. I wanted it even more of a train wreck. I, I Buckle up, guys. I have to say that I didn't have... I, I enjoyed watching this a lot, and it was not nearly as bad as I thought it was going to be. Um, this is the best cinematic Reed Richards. This is the only Reed Richards I didn't actively hate throughout the other movies, and I actively hate the other two in the other movies. It's the best comic book accurate Doctor Doom we've ever had oh, it's in so the movies. Beautiful, but it's true. It's true. It actually is. Yeah. It's a better Doctor Doom. I mean, it's still a terrible movie, but think about other movies that I will tell you I would rather watch than this because I thought about a list of some of them that I think I would rather watch. This this for me is, this is the quest for peace. That's what this movie is. And and there are movies that I would rather not watch. This is, this is I had a more entertaining fun time than I did with Batman Forever, than I did with Batman and Robin, than I did with X-Men Apocalypse, than I did with X-Men The Last Stand, than I, I had a better time with this than Batman vs. Superman. Like... This is bad, but it knows what it is. Like, and it's never trying to be more than that. Um, which is kind of the beauty of Roger Corman. Like, that's that's what he does. So I I honestly I had a good time. Like, this is this is uh the, the mummy. The the 90s mummy movies that that my buddy Scott and I would get absolutely hammered and watch when we had on Wednesday nights in college. And just, you know, may, talk shit to the screen or whatever, but we'd watch a hundred times because they were so dumb, they were fun. And I think this was intended to be dumb fun, and I appreciated it on that level. Oh my goodness. Yeah, I mean, where does it rank for you guys as far as Fantastic Four movies? Oh, it's still number one. It's number one. It is oh, for yeah. me. The other three are, are unwatchable. And I, I didn't even throw those on my list, but like, those are... Those movies are abominations. They are so bad. And this is an intentional abomination that's at least pleasant to, yeah, and enjoyable to watch in its badness. Those are just unwatchable. I also say this would be a fun movie to watch with people. I think if I wasn't by myself, yeah. I probably could have enjoyed this a lot more than I did. Because, uh, yeah, it, 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 it calls for to me an event where you're drunk and making jokes with your friends and, and half paying attention to it kind of thing. Well, speaking of paying half attention to it, we better as well get to uh, other nerd news. I'm a nerd. We have news for the beautiful people. There's a lot more of us in our view. All right, this time we spun the wheel and it came up all marks. Mark, other new <laughs> nerd news, take it away. All right, so... Um... For fans of basic cable comedy, uh, this week, It's Always Sunny in Philadelphia had their season finale, and it's gotten quite a bit of attention because the last five minutes of the show were basically a completely serious, unironic interpretive dance number, and... I we talked about this just briefly off uh, air, but um, did either of you guys, for the dozens and dozens of fans out there listening, uh, did either of you guys watch this episode at all before I, I launch into it? I didn't see the the episode itself. I saw the da dance sequence and read an article that gave a lot of background of what the story was that you had sent me. So okay. I know the context of it, and I've seen the dance itself, but I haven't seen the whole episode. I was a huge fan of this show for a very long time. I kind of fell off when I didn't have cable anymore, so I was very interested but wasn't able to watch. Um, but I'm interested in hearing more about it because it seems like such a departure from at least how I remember the show. Yeah. Okay, so so briefly uh, to recap, and I, I don't want to get too much into the specifics of this episode um, because I'm more concerned uh, with questions about art that it touches on. But 
Uh, basically, the the character of Mac, played by Rob McElhenney, um, whose cousin I used to hang out with all the time in San Francisco, by the way. Uh, Philly Dave, you're not listening, but... Uh, Philly, uh, Philly Dave was his cousin? Billy Dave is his cousin. Wow. Like first cousin. Okay. Yeah. Um, so he came out last season um, more to himself, really, than to anybody else because everyone knew that he was gay. But this whole season had, a, of course, Sonny in Philadelphia Manor been about him kind of coming to terms with being gay and being very um, ironic and snarky and you know, lots of jokes at his expense. So... The season finale starts out kind of the same way, where they want to do a float in the gay pride parade. And so uh, Danny DeVito's character, Frank, is trying to get him to dance on the float because he's the only authentic gay man that they have. And, you know, Mac is not feeling it. He doesn't know where he fits in as a gay man. He's kind of struggling with his identity now that he's come out. And so the first 15 minutes of the episode play out like a very typical sort of sunny in Philadelphia. Um, you know, Frank doesn't get it, and he's terribly homophobic and saying all kinds of inappropriate things, and they try taking Mac to different gay clubs in order to get him to, to feel it. And it's, it's not working, and it's not even, honestly, it wasn't even that funny. It was kind of formulaic for their standards. The, the jokes didn't have a ton of uh, punch to them. Uh, but then what happens is, after, at the 16th minute, the show takes a complete left-hand turn, and it gets incredibly serious and unironic where Danny, where Frank says to Mac, listen, you need to come out to your dad in order for you to make sense of who you are. And so they then go to the prison where Mac's dad is, and... Mac comes out via this interpretive dance routine that he does um, with a woman who is actually in real life as a professional ballerina. And it, it's an incredibly well done dance routine. I don't know a lot about dance, but I talked to my wife who does. And the fact that they were doing it on a in the rain on a wet studio means that it incredibly upped the difficulty factor for Rob McElhenney, who is not at all a dancer. Uh, but it's it, it shot cinematically. Um, the lighting is very different from certainly anything that they've ever done. The editing is different. The camera work. Um, and it's all presented completely unironically. Like I said, it's not a setup for a joke. It's not at any point meant to belittle the character um, of Mac or what he's going through, which is the complete opposite of anything Sonny's ever done. Um, and at the end of it, um, Frank, who spent the entire episode, you know, talking about how he doesn't get it, how he doesn't get Mac and he doesn't get the whole gay thing. He's watching it and he's weeping and he says, oh, my God, I get it. And then everybody in the audience in attendance stands up and applauses, cut to credits. And, you know, so, of course, it, it's completely totally different than anything that's ever happened. It's totally different from the first 16 minutes of the episode, which, you know, when you see it in retrospect, that was the point. It was sort of an Andy Kaufman kind of feint where they setting you up thinking it's going to be one thing and then they hit you with something else. And it's very, you know, it's very well done. And of course they, you know, they talked about afterwards and they said they did it because they got such a, when Mac came out in the previous season, got such a positive response from the LGBTQ community about it that they kind of wanted to, to pay homage to them. Well, and it's it's worth noting, too, that he, the, the actual actor, yeah. Rob McElney or uh, McElhaney, was, was raised by a lesbian couple. So I imagine it's an issue that is really important to him as well, too, personally. Right, right. And, and you know... And, of course, the usual Twitter trolls come out about how, oh, this is, you know, changing the show and it's a sell blah, blah, blah. But, I mean, if you look back over the course of the show's history, they're actually very respectful and sensitive to gay people. They're just making fun of Mac all the time. And it's not that he's gay. It's that he's so horribly repressed because of his religion. And that's where the humor plays in. Um, and so it, it was consistent. But, at any rate, the, the point being is that – after I watched it, I was very confused, actually. Not, not like that, but <laughs> I, was, um, I, I was thinking 
about this and how basically it was an incredibly artistic version of a very special episode of Blossom. That it was that 80s sitcom trope where you would have a show that, you know, was, you know, laugh fast, you know, laugh fast every week. And then suddenly, you know, this is an episode you want to watch with your children. Will Arnold be molested by Gordon Jump as the bike salesman or not? And it's a horrible, it's it's an incredible tonal shift. And in the past, you know, everybody kind of rightly makes fun of those very special episodes because they're so poorly executed. You know, they're heavy handed, they're cheesy, they're, they're not conceptually well done or the, the plots are intricate or it's not even a departure necessarily from the story structure. It's simply same characters with no jokes. Now, this is a case where they basically did a very special episode, but they did it incredibly well, right? With the whole setup of the first 16 minutes, you know, being a faint for the last five and the fact that the dance was well done and well shot. And so my confusion is I'm not sure how I feel about this as an episode of It's Always Sunny in Philadelphia. It's a great 21 minutes of TV, but I don't know if it's a good episode of that particular show. And this is kind of what I'm struggling with. And so, I mean, I know you haven't watched this show in particular, but I kind of wanted to, to you know, bring up this topic with you about sort of art in general, um, because this does happen with long running TV shows where you've got to be you know, innovative to stay fresh. Um, you know, are the creators to some extent you're breaking their contract with the audience and saying, hey, you know, normally this is the product we give you and suddenly we're going to give you something else, something that you're not expecting. And, you know, how to feel about that? You know, do you, do you evaluate it as a standalone piece of art? Do you evaluate it as part of the whole that is a series? I, I don't know. And so I kind of I, I wanted to kind of sort of get your input on this whole concept. So I personally think the the concept of a, a contract with the audience is bullshit. Um, I don't think you're beholden to your audience f- for anything. Like it, you get you get the right to write what you want to write and and make what you want to make, and people have the right to like it or not like it, tune in next week or not tune in. But to say, well, we made you know two seasons in a certain way and people really liked it, so now we have to make all seasons that way, is you know, it's it's the Poochie episode of The Simpsons, right? <laughs> like people are going to be unhappy either way and people your your viewership's going to change over time no matter what because people are going to burn out or people are not going to like what you do or new people are going to discover it and they're going to jump on as time goes by. I mean, you know, like how how many, you know, you love Rick and Morty and you watch it a lot. How many of those episodes have you watched when they actually premiered? Right? None. Exactly. And and there's a lot of shows that are like that. So for, so for, for people who are are writers and creators and and artists to think that they have to continue to do something in a certain way to me is, is garbage. You know, I, you know, musically, would you do, you, you don't want your favorite artist to make the same song over and over. You want them to do different things. You want them to grow and change as you grow and change because the things, you know, it's always sunny has been on 13 years. The things I thought were funny 13 years ago, I don't necessarily think are funny anymore. Uh, the things I want to see and hear and read and talk about aren't the same as I did 13 years ago. So if I'm going to stick with something long term, it's going to need to grow and change as well. Otherwise, I'm going to get bored or want to move on. And I don't think you need to put qualifiers on it. Um, It can be your favorite episode of Sunny, even though it's not like any other episode of Sunny. Or it cannot be yours, even though it might be more important you know, than Dennis and Mac Manhunters. You may just enjoy watching Dennis and Mac Manhunters more, and there's nothing wrong with that either, even though this might be a a better artistic expression. The best movie, for me, the best artistic creation cinematically, for me, is Metropolis from, you know, Fritz Lang way back in the day. But it's a three-hour silent movie. It is not the movie I've seen the most. It's a chore to watch, and I appreciate it for what it is, but... 
you know, if it's Saturday night, I want to watch Zoolander, you know, and not think about it and have a couple beers or Roger Corman's Fantastic Four, apparently. Um, so I, I think trying to put so many qualifiers on what art has to be or, or what's beholden is, is is kind of a waste of time. Like, it's kind of our tiny mantra on the show is like what you like and who gives a fuck where it fits in or what other people think of it. Like, you know, if you want to disagree with most movie goers and critics and, 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 and have solo be a really great movie for you, then you are, you're welcome to do it, you know, and, and we won't think much less of you. We'll just, we'll embrace you and say, you know what? Like what you like. Good for you, buddy. For me, these are always the episodes that I remember. And we talk about Star Wars. My favorite episode of Star Wars is not actually solo. It's Rogue One which was the departure. And even though I love Star Wars as a franchise, it's that one that really speaks to me. You talk about 80s sitcoms. My favorite 80s sitcom growing up when I was six years old was Facts of Life. Which one episode do I remember? It was the one where uh, Michael J. Fox broke the, the third wall and talked to the audience about something. I don't even remember what it was, but I just remember that moment. What's my favorite episode of Saved by the Bell? It's when Jesse gets hooked on, on uh, Speed. You well, know? that's everybody's favorite. Right. Well, favorite. But, but these no. are the I've these are everybody's favorite. Them, these are everybody's favorite episodes. My favorite episode of Breaking Bad was The Fly. Used to be The Fly. Um, these were these departures, and I talked to you off air about the X Files. My favorite episode was when they completely did something different in that episode called Small Potatoes. These are the ones that I remember and still love these series for everything that they are, but I enjoy it when they take departures and, and do something a little bit out of the norm. Um, it keeps it fresh and it, it makes you think. My favorite episode of The uh, the Sopranos was the last one because it was so different and weird and without ending. Um, so I welcome this sort of thing. Okay, well, but so there's a couple things, and I'm not necessarily disagreeing with you. I'm still kind of you know, trying to work my way through this and, and figure it. It's not that it's different from prior episodes. Because, I mean, even Sunny in Philadelphia has played with their own format, right? They did musical with The Nightman Cometh. Or they had the one where the gang saves the day where they do a bunch of dream vignettes about how they foil a gas station robbery. My, my question is, though, is about tonality. Is that... Um, it's not that the format changed, it's that the tone so completely changes. And not even that if you know people like it or don't like it, but if you look at the series as a whole, as one piece of art, you know, as one fully completed piece of art, um, and TV being, you know, sequential and serial is, you know, unique from movies or books or, or a lot of other forms. Does having one episode that is totally inconsistent with the rest, you know, how does, is that a problem in that it doesn't mix with the rest of the singular piece of art? You know, it's like if, like, look, if you're watching Metropolis and suddenly around, you know, minute, two hours and 37 minutes, they make a fart joke. And then they move on, and then they tell the rest of the movie from that point on. But did that one, you know, sort of mis I'm, misplaced isn't quite the right word, but is that one fart joke that's totally out of place with the rest of the film, does that affect the overall body of it? And, you know, is TV, you know, or does a TV show even have to worry about something like that? Well, I... I... No, I don't think a TV show does for the reasons I stated earlier. And as far as your Metropolis example goes, it depends on if the joke is good, right? So if you like this episode of Sunny and you think it's a good episode of Sunny, I don't think it matters that it's a tone change. And if there is a fart joke or whatever in the middle of Metropolis, if it's a good joke, then no, I don't mind it. And it doesn't affect so th those things. If it's a bad one, like, you know, Webster burning the house down, then, then yeah, it does, right? But it, it, if you execute something well, just because it's not in your normal tone, for me, it, it doesn't degrade the overall arc of the show or how I think about the show. Um, it just makes me think very similar to what Maya said. They took a chance and they did something, you know, extraordinary and it really worked out. So it's just kind of a... a it's it's a cool new chunk in the legacy of something that I already appreciated for 
for different reasons, now I have a new reason to appreciate part of that legacy. Yeah, my answer doesn't change either, because out of the ones that I mentioned, only really Breaking Bad and The Sopranos and those episodes that I touched on didn't have a tonal shift. The other ones really did. And you're reminding me of one of my all-time favorite movies, Monty Python and the Holy Grail, where there's one of those at the end, a complete tonal shift, or more of an expositional shift, when it goes from uh, the, you know, the... The, uh, where the police basically just bust in and start arresting people. So um, I really like that. You know what? I'll, I'll give you what m- my best example I think of this is, Mark, is um, is the, m- the movie Wally, right? Because the first half of, of Wally, which is my favorite Pixar movie, is adorable. Like, I just want to hug that robot. I just want him and his cockroach fan to have a good time. I want Eve to hold his hand so desperately. And then you go on to the ship, and it's a bunch of of satire about what a fat, lazy, destructive culture we are that can't do anything for ourselves. And I, it, I never saw that coming and it hit me hard and I thought it was awesome. Like it was kind of like you lulled me in with one thing and then you hit me with something else. And I appreciated it from both ends. So I, I, I really think that when you pull this type of thing off, well, it's just a, it's just a really great artistic achievement, really great move. Like you know, to make you think one way and then purposely make you think another way. I, you know, I, I, I think you're, you're affecting emotion, which is, I think the goal of what all these pieces that we're talking about are trying to do. And I think Sonny has affected you in the way that it set out to affect you with that episode. I think what you're talking about and what you're thinking is the exact reason that they did it. Oh yeah. No, I mean, so, so first off, I, I you, you know, to be clear, I'm glad they did it. I'm glad they made it. I'm glad I saw it. I'm glad it exists. Um, and I, I certainly, you know, it, it also achieved what art did in that it made me think about it for more than five seconds after I turned it off. I mean, it's something I've been turning over my head. I mean, I guess a part of it for me was I was also thinking too is about the difference between television shows in Britain versus here. Because, you know, in Britain, a TV show will be two seasons long four episodes a season and then it's done it's one complete story that that's kind of their model right where you you don't have shows that go on for 15 20 simpsons length seasons whereas in america we do have that and so you know my favorite shows the wire the sopranos were relatively short relatively contained and had sort of a very clear arc going from the beginning to the end. And so I tend to think of shows as one piece of art, right? That the first episode and the last episode are part of the same thing. And, you know, when you have shows that have been going on 13, 14, you know, into infinity seasons, the need to, to do this kind of creativity, um, to, to innovate and to change and play with formats, change with, you know, play with the tone to, to introduce new characters or, or new situations. Um, you know, while it, it can lead to, you know, great individual pieces of art, I'm still not sure how I feel about it as part of the whole. Right. And, and that, I guess, um, I haven't necessarily gotten resolution from this conversation on, but you know, it's something I'll continue to mull over. And, uh, I definitely think it's a conversation worth having as you think about this. Well, uh, I think you've given us all things to think about. Um, we'll have to think about it on until next week. So, Luke, where can they find you? I am. What am I? I'm at Luke underscore Neitzel, N-E-I-T-Z-E-L, on Twitter. Mark, where can they find you? They can find me in the gym trying to get as ripped as Rob is in that final five minutes during that dancing because that dude was insanely jacked. Read us quotes on that, too, because it's very funny. Yeah. Maya, what about you? I'm at Maya Madrid, and together we are at Kids Seriously, and we'll give you something to think about over the course of this week. Just just um, like Bonnie Raitt. So... Oh, that was something to talk about. Damn. <laughs> Bye. Thanks for listening to Kids Seriously. If you didn't completely hate us, feel free to hit like, subscribe, or tell a friend about the show. If you want to write to us and tell us how much we suck, or just ask a question, you can reach us at kidsseriouslyradio at gmail.com. Otherwise, hit us up on Twitter at kidsseriously.
Thanks, and we'll see you next time.